Welcome back to the Dale Wiley Show, letting everybody know that in addition to these podcasts, if you go to dalewiley.com, there's a free novella waiting there for you called Kissing Persuasive Lips that I wrote. So go over to the website, sign up for the mailing list, and get yourself an afternoon of reading. So right now, I am pleased to present America's friend, Kinky Friedman, for a talk about music and politics and writing and Nelson Mandela. Kinky, thanks for coming on tonight. Hey, it's great to be here, Dale. I, I think um, <laughs> it's a, this is Thursday, right? Yeah, it is okay. Thursday. Been, yes, it is. Uh, everybody I talk to is confused about what day it is and what planet it is. Yes, I agree. At um, any rate, um, caught me in an up mood. <laughs> Which is uh, unusual, so don't believe anything I tell you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll take it all with a grain of salt. Okay. I, I spent an earlier part of tonight talking to Mojo Nixon, who. Uh, <laughs> I <didn't say> hi. <laughs> Mojo is a great one. Yeah, he's a, he's a great one, and he uh, taught me how to use the word motherfucker often. <laughs> he it, it's very me. it's very applicable word to most situations, most people. Um, so, uh, uh, including my, my new my new toast, "Don't die in me, motherfucker." <laughs> when you, you know, I mean, obviously, you kind of came to Austin with a little sense of you know country music history. What what were what was the first kind of music that really meant something to you? Probably seeing Ernest Tubb at the Skyline Club, and uh, seeing Bob Dylan uh, at the uh, Whatever the hell the auditorium was in Austin, I was about fifteen, I guess. Uh-huh. And uh, I was just uh, okay. You know, I came from a rather upper middle class um, Jewish family, and uh, that's never a good background for a country singer. <laughs> had, had I been born like Glenn Campbell, you know, on an Arkansas dirt farm someplace, I think I could have climbed the the ladder to success a uh-huh. lot faster. When did you when did you start playing? I mean, how how long when you got to Austin did did it take you to start forming the Jew Boys and everything? Was there any prior incarnation? Yeah, there was a, a band in high school, the, the, the Three Rejects, and uh-huh. uh, and the uh, and King Arthur and the Carrots. We made a oh. record. Uh huh. Uh, a Beach Beach Boy kind of record that was pretty good. And got a lot of airplay locally and whatever. And then uh, I guess after college we uh, we put together uh, well quite a bit after college. I joined the Peace Corps for a couple of years in the jungles of Borneo. <laughs> and when I got back, uh, we you know I hitchhiked around the country and hung out in Nashville a bunch in L.A. And then uh, put together the Jew Boys in Nashville. Okay. And that was in Nashville, not in Austin. No, it wasn't in Austin. We recorded the first record. Well, we recorded a record up here at the ranch, up in the hill country. Uh-huh. Um, and then uh, then we took that out to L.A. And almost got record deals, but never quite. I think uh, the word Jew Boy, I think, kept the... Some of the top guys uh, from signing us. Uh-huh. They just didn't know what they tell their mothers. <laughs> and, well, uh, anyway, it was kind of a, uh, you know, it happened. I, I think the Glazer brothers are who did it in Nashville. The Chuck and Tom Paul made made it happen. And uh, you know, I, one of the things, I, I mean, you did a lot of, you know, I mean played a lot with Dylan and, and you did some other things and you know some of those records are just really great and I think are highly underrated it's you know not only the the originals that you guys did but you know you had some great covers of you know just kind of old Jimmy Rogers songs and I mean there's some really good stuff there that I think is kind of overlooked yeah yeah but that's the way it goes we're we're the ones, Dale, who buried Mozart in a pauper's grave. Don't forget. <laughs> but 
Yeah, we never get the public never quite gets it right. But right. the last uh, the last last record, the latest one, uh, the loneliest man I ever met, is um, getting absolutely rave reviews. I haven't seen anybody say anything bad about it yet. It's just, it's incredible, and I don't I don't know if it's a sympathy thing because I'm 71 years old, <laughs> though I read at the 73 year old level. Oh, you do. Yeah. Um, but well, uh, it's it's really uh, I think it's the best thing I ever did, and uh, so far, and a um, couple of those songs, Christmas card from a hooker in Minneapolis, right? Tom Williams and, song. Yeah, and and my shit's fucked up. Uh huh. And uh, listen to some of that other stuff on there. It's a very good record for one, not done in a studio, done without click tracks or drums for that matter. Uh huh. Very, very kind of redheaded stranger type of, uh, very sparse. So it's guaranteed not to get much airplay, but, <laughs> but it's uh, selling very well. So that one's turning into a financial pleasure for the Kingster. Well, good. Um, so what? Um, you're going to be playing a lot of dates with that too, right? Yeah, we already have, and we're going to be going out February 5th again, uh-huh. starting in Houston and uh, going through the southeast about 10 shows uh-huh. then in may we're doing a lot of yeah we're doing about 30 shows in europe oh wow and doing 30 in about a little more than 30 days not much more wow so a lot of travel and uh but europe's europe's good i'm the new david hasselhoff in germany <laughs> so it's fun <laughs> well, good. shows are sold out they're all young people and they know every lyric of every song Wow, they've read, they've read most of my books, so it's a, it's a great audience. Oh, that's great! That's that, a smart that, audience. Yeah, it's probably a welcome um, change from American audiences. That yeah, American audiences would prefer to see Celine Dion if they could. <laughs> it's most just not in their budget. <laughs> not all of them. <laughs> and so, when you uh, when you think about now, I've got to ask you: the the Wichita that was in your band was your Wichita first? Or was the um, Roadhogs Wichita first? Uh, that's a good question. I don't have the answer to it. Okay. Ours but, came about in 19, say, 72. Okay. So they well, must have been before that, wouldn't you think? I, I I don't know. I just I thought that was a funny thing because I didn't know who was aping who with that very unusual country names so i just i wanted to know if there was a easy yeah wichita clear. has been bugled to jesus by now but yeah. he uh he was a good one he was yeah. a real good one and uh <laughs> the jew boys really were you know you know they had real country uh spirit something there that uh people recognized well and they could play some rock and roll too though there's some mm-hmm. yeah. the rock and roll across the usa and a lot of songs that hold up pretty well, in my opinion. So, yeah, it um, just wasn't. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe this loneliest man I ever met is kind of a unconscious concept album. But uh-huh. it, sure, it sounds good. It really does. And, yeah, uh, it does. And I think it's it's not overproduced. For instance, it lets you bring your own imagination into play. You know, uh, right. As you're listening to a song, you can actually think a little bit. Uh huh. And the rest of the stuff coming out of Nashville really does sound like background music at a frat party. Yeah, yeah, it does at a bad frat party. Mm-hmm. When a bad frat party, yeah. When somebody's going to end up date raped. <laughs> I think that's the way. I <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so after you stopped touring so much with the Jew Boys and kind of with the background of New York City and and everything else, you started writing some some novels and actually, is there another Novel coming out soon, or yeah, what? there is. Okay, it's tell me called uh, the Return of Kinky Friedman by Kinky Friedman. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and so, uh, are we going to see some of the recurring characters? I mean, oh what, yeah, what we, yeah, it's a continuation after Kinky almost dies on a bridge. Yeah. Okay. He comes and, back. So. Where where's that coming out? When's that coming out? All that? Uh, I'd say uh, give it three months, maybe. Okay. Whatever it takes for a book to move through the bowels of the system, you know. 
<laughs> and so was that, uh, it, it's been a while. How was that to get back to writing fiction? Oh, that was fun writing it. Yeah, I hadn't written a book in a while. And um, so that was that was good. I enjoyed that. And very different from uh, writing songs. Yeah. They both require misery. <laughs> but uh, there's plenty of that to go around. So, uh, I mean, if you're happy and, uh, you know, well-adjusted, you're, you're not going to write anything great. That's all there is to it. You can't be an artist. Which do you prefer, writing a song or writing a, a longer form? Well, uh, I haven't written a song in about 30 years until, uh, until about a month ago. Now I have three brand new songs, the best of which is Jesus in Pajamas. Okay. And uh, that's real good, I think. Also like... Uh, a dog named Freedom. Okay. And then there's me and my guitar. Those three. That uh, I think uh, has some potential on, on our next record, which we're going to be doing soon. We'll be uh, we'll be done uh, uh, probably the same way, pretty much. We uh, may have Augie Meyer involved. Uh, oh wow! As well as Mickey Rayfield, who plays harp, of course, for right. Willie. Well, and, and Augie plays with the Texas Tornado. Augie plays with, yeah, with everybody. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Anyway, it's going to be uh, it'll be very interesting. There'll be more original songs on this one. On this uh -huh. one. As you kind of found yourself writing these new songs, I mean, who who influences the Kingster at this point, songwriting-wise? Uh, well, I was influenced by a friend of mine, Warren Zevon. Uh-huh. Uh, very influenced and very pleased to see that uh, my shit's fucked up is uh, catching on with a lot of people <laughs> and that they kind of understand what it is. That it, it's not just about Warren dying of cancer. It's about yeah. the state of, of our country and our world today. Uh -huh. And uh, then the, um, I don't know, uh, good songwriters uh, or simple ones, people like Johnny Cash. Yeah. Uh Roger Miller was great. Uh, uh Graham Parsons was pretty good, those guys. Yeah. Was um when you talked about Warren Zevon, how did you meet him? Another another good one by the way is Tom T. Hall. I, oh yeah. I love all of his songs and both of his melodies. <laughs> how did you meet Warren Zevon though? Uh just in LA we we came together uh, probably at parties or something like that, and then we realized we were both from Chicago. We're both Jew boys from Chicago. Okay, there you go. Uh, along with Steve Goodman, Michael Bloomfield, and Shel Silverstein. <laughs> I told that's a lot for one town. Yeah, that's a good starting five. That would yeah. that would get you somewhere. Warren's doing well for you, and, and the album's doing well for you. Yeah, um, and, and I think these guys, uh, 30 Tigers, who we're with, uh -huh. you, you know about them? Yeah. Well, they're they're kind of they're, they're not quite a record company. They're kind of halfway between a you know an investment firm and a and a record company. Right. And unlike a, with a record company, if they take your record, they'll pay you something, and you'll never see another dime, no matter what happens. <laughs> but with uh, Thirty Tigers, as soon as you pay back what they advanced you, you own seventy percent of the record. Okay. And that's for all time. And a, and a record like The Loneliest Man I Ever Met continues to do a little bit better every week. And it's, wow. been, out, it's been out for three months. And uh, usually uh, today in our cultural ADD society, you notice that something will hit number one on the charts, and the next week no one's even heard of it. It's gone, yeah. <laughs> you know, like that. Right. And uh, that's just the way we are. If it's not trending, uh, we don't. We're not interested. But this one's actually gaining some steam. Though. That's got to be a good feeling, kind of getting back out there. And oh, it's great. Yeah, and it's nice. Uh, I didn't mean to make the whole uh, David Hasselhoff point lightly. Uh, just because the German audiences are, are terrific, and uh, <laughs> and to be able to fill these houses that we're playing, like sixteen shows or something. 
is uh, with, without a hit song, without a you know never having had a hit. Forty years after these songs were written, in other words, uh, the song the songs are older than than the audience. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, they get it, man. They really understand. I think that one of the things that, that strikes me about you and and some other people that that aren't afraid to display their wit, uh, you know, when they're writing songs or writing novels or whatever, is, you know, just just the amount of people that just misinterpret and misconstrue everything. Because I I still get a kick out of the fact that um, clearly with your sense of humor that you were named Chauvinist of the Year back in 1973. Um, yeah, well, and, I'm still very proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> The, but only, I, the only honor I have that eclipses that is the certain knowledge that uh, Nelson Mandela listened to Rodham Jew Boy in his prison cell on Rhode uh-huh. Island every night for his last three years. Oh, wow. In prison there. And we get that from Tokyo Sechuale, who was in his right hand man, who was in the cell next to him. Oh, and wow. And Tokyo is up to be president of FIFA now. Oh, okay. So that's good. And uh, anyway, Tokyo told me that uh, Mandela would play it like a sign-off song. It would be the last thing he'd play every night. Sometimes he'd play it two or three times. <laughs> oh, and wow. and uh, that, uh, you know, that's – now, Bill Clinton, his favorite kinky song is a Waitress, Please Waitress, Come Sit on My Face. <laughs> but that says a lot about both of them, doesn't it? It tells you something about them, yeah. yeah. Mandela's is, Mandela could have been listening to Get Your Biscuits in the Oven and Your Buns in the Bed, you know. He could have. Right, absolutely. But he didn't. Yeah. Well, that uh, that's that's really neat. And, and you know, again. Yeah, that's I'm, something that's, uh, you know, it's like a Kurt Vonnegut novel. I mean, it's very, very strange. But you could think a long time of what he might be listening to that he, someone had smuggled in, you know. You know, and, I... I was lucky enough to get to have lunch when I was in college with Kurt Vonnegut. And, you know, there was this big group of people that came to the lunch, and they were, you know, some intellectual heavyweights, William Gass, the novelist, and some other people. And and you could tell that Gass kind of came ready to perform. You know, he was ready to be the center of attention, and we got there. And all Vonnegut wanted to talk about was baseball. (laughs) And luckily... (laughs) I was the only one qualified there to talk about baseball, so I got to talk about the 1992 Mets with with Kurt Vonnegut, which was a highlight of my life, I'd have to say. (laughs) Well, I've urinated next to some famous people. Well, there you go. (laughs) Uh, Groucho Marx. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, Jimmy Page. Oh, wow. And, uh, of course, Willie. Uh, I've urinated (laughs) next to Willie a number of times. Usually outdoors. There you go. <laughs> yeah, well, so tell me about Groucho Marx, not the urination part, but what what did you think of Groucho? Well, Groucho was he was great. Um, he told me uh, don't. Uh, he told me uh, we were in New York. He told me go back to Texas. Ah. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, he also somebody was trying to introduce us to each other. This woman from Time Magazine. He said, I've already met everybody I want to know. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, yeah, I mean, I met him. He was already an old guy. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, old, older than I am. <laughs> now, uh, my, my friend Imus uh, has moved to Texas. Uh-huh. And he says uh, that he's growing his hair very long and tying it up with a red bandana, and he looks like Willie Nelson's grandmother. <laughs> I need to know a little bit about uh, your views on this very interesting presidential race. What What's your take on this whole thing? Well, I talked to Willie about it a few weeks ago, and I found we're both on the same page for a change politically. Okay, all right. And we're both for Bernie. Oh, I figured. I figured. Willie's for him uh, ideologically. He's just to the left of center. Willie's to the left of center, whatever, whatever center is. <laughs> And uh, I'm for him because I want to see a G in the White House. <laughs> and also, if Bernie wins, it'll be the first time a Jewish family ever moved into a place a black family had moved out of. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 
What do you think about the Republican candidates? I'll probably wind up uh, for Trump, although I like Cruz. I don't like Mario, Marco, whatever the hell his name is. <laughs> Marco, I like him. <laughs> Marco Polo. Marco Polo. And uh, Ben Carson, what do you think of Ben? I think Ben's an example of how fickle a fucking American audience is. One okay. minute they all love him, and then they uh, they all turn off. Nothing yeah. Ben did would have made any difference. Right. Right, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, there uh, that's cultural ADD. That's all it is. They, they like the idea of this black guy who's very soft-spoken, who's a neurosurgeon, and they like that for about one minute, and then they're off with somebody else. But I do think you judge a president by uh, his growth in office, by whether he listens to his better angels. Uh -huh. and, it's, and it's clear that the man we elected to affect change is incapable of it himself. Yeah. And that Obama has not grown one centimeter in office. Right. So it doesn't right. matter if you come from reality TV or whether you come from uh, social working or whatever else uh, Obama did. But once you're in office, the question is, how do you change and develop? Like when you look at uh, Churchill or FDR, they're both born aristocrats. They're right. horrible people. I mean, you know, when they were younger, we all would have hated them. <laughs> um, and yet something happened when they wielded this great power. They developed kind of a palpable bond with uh, the common man. Both right. And right. when they died, it was the common man who grieved the most for them. Yeah. Uh, because they knew this is our guy. Yeah. And they were right. Yeah. And we haven't had that for a while. No, we really haven't. And when you look at another thing that makes me very proud of the Nelson Mandela story uh -huh. is, is that when you look at the landscape of Africa today and you look at America, you don't see a Nelson Mandela running or anything. Right. You don't see any Nelson Mandelas in there, and that's too damn bad. Oh, yeah. I think sometimes we get who we deserve, you know, and I think... That's... Yeah, well, that's exactly right. Uh, um, Harry Truman was Ray Price's last favorite president, the last one that he really loved and respected, he said. So the Democrats are, you know, I'm a proud Red Sea pedestrian. I'm pro-Israel. <laughs> and uh, I'm, the Democrats have done everything they can to further isolate Israel. Yeah, who's already working without a net. And the right. whole Iranian, this whole Iranian deal, I mean, like, John Kerry is a creature from outer space that uh, was sent down here to try our patience. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about, um, what do you think about Ms. Um, Rodham Clinton? What, what do you think about her? Well, I used to be for her. Uh, not anymore. Not after Benghazi. So I see her as a um, empty pants suit, pretty much. Okay. And, um, I don't think she's going to make it, I'll tell you the truth. Really? Yeah. I yeah, gonna... I mean, do you think Bernie's going to best her? Yeah. Or... Okay. Well, I think she's going to flame out at some point, and I think she's got to do this. This is some serious stuff, this uh, email stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, you said you you were leaning towards Trump. Tell me, Tell me what you like about him. I like the fact that he doesn't apologize. I mean, I'm not a Trump fan. Because uh -huh. I, I don't like a guy who gives a million dollars to a children's hospital and has to put his name up on the wall. Yeah. I like Mr. Anonymous. Sure. But uh, Trump will never be that. But um yeah. can't be all things. But uh, he doesn't apologize. He's uh, really uh, battling political correctness, which is a, probably a losing battle in our country. <laughs> Because it, it just made so many, it's invaded our culture so deeply. I mean, we used to call Mexicans greasers, you know. Now uh, we call them, now we call them lubricanos. <laughs> well, so uh, you've battled political correctness for much longer than that. I mean, if that's the only thing you got to have to run on, I think you should be the next candidate. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm uh, pretty well through with politics. You know, my oh, definition I... of politics, poly means more than one, and ticks are blood-sucking parasites. <laughs> and that's what we have. So uh, what, what... It, it is just what I said when I ran for governor of Texas, uh, a race that we won every place but Texas. Right. Um, I, uh, 
I called the Democrats and Republicans the Crips and the Bloods, and people said, oh, come on. It's not that. But uh, I was close, I think. And I think most people feel that way about politicians. That's why about 80% of the people in the country are are independents. Right. Either they're, they're headed that way or they already are or they, they are and they don't know it. So do you have any further ideas out? I mean, do you see anyone on the – on the horizon, maybe on, on a lower level that, that you think has potential to be a good leader? Yeah, but they're not running for office. JFK's dream did not come true about all of us helping our country. Right. Uh, and getting into politics. Um, musicians would be better than politicians. Uh, being on the road as a musician, performing for people, that's a very high calling. Uh-huh. Uh, sales very close to telling the truth. <laughs> to ride, all you got to do is ride, shoot straight, and tell the truth. Can you do that? Well, they can't. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a, a large undertaking these days. Yeah, and it's kind of a kind of too bad, uh, but it really is true that uh, if we elected nothing but musicians, we would have a very creative leadership. The one that could solve problems, a uh, decent one, and uh-huh. wouldn't be corrupt. And I think the only two guys running for office for president that are not corrupt are probably uh, Bernie and uh, Trump. Okay. I've always thought Dolly Parton would be the perfect presidential candidate because she'd be better than what we got. You know, she could be and a great. By the way, by the way, uh, Tokyo Seshwale told me not to get a swelled head about Mandela listening to ride him Jew boy in his prison cell. But um, I was not his favorite singer. He said, that was Dolly Parton. <laughs> so you won't be getting any invitation to the World Cup is what you're saying. <laughs> All right. Well, but it's, a, it's a good thing. I mean, it's really, uh, well, you know, when you make a record, you know you, that you're never, like in 73, we made that first record, Sold American. Um, and you just don't know who's going to hear it. You never know. Right. But the last thing in my mind, we were worried about the disc jockeys getting it. And the last thing in my mind was that Nelson Mandela would be listening to this in prison. Oh, that's just, that's an amazing, amazing story. And to think that you were a part of that journey. That's Yeah, that's, that's a that's a good one. That's better than winning a Grammy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, Kinky, I've appreciated the time and and uh we're going to put some links up to the new record and and list some dates and going to let right. you and uh, send the podcast out to your fans maybe through your website. But uh anything you want to plug or say or Yeah, anything? I just want to tell the folks uh, remember Jesus loves you can be very comforting words unless you hear them in a Mexican prison. <laughs> there we go. All right. Thanks a lot, Kinky. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks, Dale. Thanks for listening to my interview with Kinky Friedman. Hope you enjoyed it. Visit dalewileyshow.net. Visit dalewiley.com if you need a free book. Buy some books. Throw some money. Copyright 2016.